Welcome, everybody, back to Pester Quest. My name is Brodimus. Last time we had Dave, which was just a just a treat to go through that. Today, I believe, unless I'm mistaken, it's Jade. Oh, the loneliest girl in the world. All right, so volume four is here. So, uh, I, I got nothing. Let's just get on with it. <laughs> All of the okay, okay. All right, I like it when the music starts immediately. I really like that. Just. That's so bouncy. Oh, okay. Oh, excuse me. I like that. Okay. All right. All right. All right. I'm done reveling in the music. This is delightful. This is a. This is just a treat. After <clears throat> being at work all day. Here we go. It. Just a curveball every three seconds. It's been days, and your stomach still hasn't recovered from Olive Garden, but you can't spend forever moping around. There are friends to make. Damn it. Well, just one left in this set. Her name is Jade Harley, and though, oh, excuse me, and though all three of your new pals consider themselves good friends with her, they know strikingly little about her life. That's extremely <laughs> distracting, actually. The most you have gleaned is that she lives on a mysterious island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean with her grandfather and some uncommon breed of dog. The communication with her has been limited to internet messages and packages sent to a P.O. box in some podunk town called Haunt Switch. Oh! Oh, okay, so Haunt Switch... Okay, interesting. <clears throat> John said he would message her and see if she could provide an address, but you don't want to wait. Throwing yourself headlong into friendship has always worked for you. I mean, you're not wrong, kinda. So you close your eyes, think islandy thoughts, and hope it works. But something strange happens as you channel your powers. A loud bark echoes somewhere in the distance, and nuclear green energy sparks in the air around you. You catch a split-second glimpse of a massive green sun, and then you hit the ground on your hands and knees. The whole event can't have taken more than a second or two. Okay. Alright. Alright, so we meet Beck. Alright. There's Beck. Hello, Beck. You blink and focus your vision. You are inside a room. The floor is smooth and white, and disrupting the monotony in front of you are a set of similarly white paws attached to a lucis. Uh, you mean, an animal. You slowly stagger up and look him over. You know what, I never thought about it, but Beck is really close to a lucis, isn't he? Huh. He is a very large and fluffy dog. His snout- He's so cute. His snout held up high. A long green tongue hangs from his open mouth as he pants lightly, and the air around him crackles with electricity, making the fur on his back stand on end. Something about him feels so familiar to you. Familiar twice over. His fuzzy and regal form reminds you of a warmth you once knew, but those neon sparks fill your stomach with dread. At the very least, he seems friendly. He leans in and drags his rough tongue along your cheek, leaving it tingling. His tail wags swiftly back and forth, and he keeps nosing at you. He seems fascinated. Aw, he's so cute. Alright, <clears throat> so we got uh, Jade, huh? <clears throat> uh, it's gonna be real close to John, warning you right now. Uh, 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 back down, boy. <laughs> oh man, she already got her gun out, good. It is this friendly demeanor of, uh, mm -mm. It is this friendly demeanor of his that leaves you shocked and he moves aside, and you find yourself staring down the barrel of a rifle. It is held aloft by a, bespectac a bespectacled young lady in a sensible skirt who really has no business pointing such a big fucking gun at you. Okay, please don't panic and don't make any sudden moves. I've never shot a living being before and it would make me very, very sad if I had to start now. Oh, okay, all right, okay. So this is happening now. Is this Jade? She doesn't sound like Jade based on what John told you. She looks more like a, like a Gigi anyway, or maybe a Lin? <laughs> Okay. Right, the gun. Don't get sidetracked. You s <laughs> right, that thing. You slowly raise your hands. Alright, this is just my theater brain kicking into mo mode here. I like that the gun isn't pointed straight at the screen, because in theater, you're not supposed to point the gun straight at the audience, because it makes them- Like, if you have a gun on stage, for whatever reason, as a prop, you don't point it straight at the audience. It makes people nervous, it makes people- uh, it, it helps- it detaches them. Uh, from watching the show so you kind of always point it to the side or if you do end up going out towards the audience You kind of do it like above or to the sides of them So it's sort of like implied, but it's not directly at them. So I really like that. It's not pointed straight at the screen Back into it you slowly raise your hands and surrender and try to, to put on your most inoffensive expression You tell her that if she started shooting living thing uh, living beings, you'd be pretty sad, too So why don't she put the down the gun and no way? I don't want to shoot you, but you are clearly a dangerous and unpredictable being, and I need to make sure I stay safe. My grandpa taught me a lot about gun safety and trigger discipline in case anything bad ever happened to me. So I know that good trigger discipline means keeping your finger on the trigger at all times in case you need to blow something to bits. Okay, alright, something's wrong there. Oh, fuck, <laughs> shit. Now let me make things clear to you. 
I'm a cl very clever girl, and you... <laughs> clever girl. I'm a very clever girl, and you won't be able to fool me as easily as you fooled the others. It's very obvious to me what you've been doing, and I knew you would eventually show up if I waited long enough. Sure enough, John messaged me not too long ago to let me know you wanted to visit, so and so I prepared myself for your arrival. You've come to interfere with our lives, and now I want to know why. So you'd better start talking, okay? Okay, okay, you say? What does she want to talk about? You're well-versed in a variety of eclectic subjects, so you can go on about basically anything? Wrestling? Postmodern art? Controversial opinions on traditional ju jurisprudence? But you get the feeling that this is an interrogation, and you really have no idea what she's interrogating you over. That's very likely story. There's an A missing in there. I can put two and two together pretty easily, you know? You've never shown up in any of my dreams before, and now none of those dreams are coming to pass. Oh, that's a fair point. Her dream bubbles aren't happening because I fucked up the timeline. Well, not me specifically. Sorry, the background keeps falling because... It's falling apart is what it is. Not to mention that I don't even see Prospect when I go to sleep anymore. Ooh. Ooh, we fucked it up that bad, huh? And that can only mean that you have derailed the forces of fate. Yep. You destroyed John's copy of Spurb and somehow that changed everything. And not only could John not begin the game, none of us could. And none of the, the meteors hit like they were supposed to. It was like the universe changed its very fabric to bend to your evil whims. Whoa, evil, that's a little harsh. You'll cop to stupid, but evil is way too much. I will claim, not the brightest bulb in the shed, but... Don't play dumb with me. What else could motivate you to stop us from fulfilling our destiny as heroes? Heroes? John and friends are very nice, but they don't exactly strike you as heroes. That's because you don't know them like I know them. You haven't seen the shrines on Prospect or heard stories from the Queen or seen them in the clouds glow uh, growing into brave and wonderful people. And now I'm beginning to suspect that those things will never come to pass. Yeah, sorry about that. John's birthday came and passed without any fanfare except for him supposedly befriending a strange mailman. And that day the internet was full of people complaining that their beta copies of Spurb weren't working. And there was a huge scandal with the company. Okay. A little while later I found out that this mailman was talking with Rose and had magical powers! I know a thing or two about magical powers, or at least powers which seem to be magical to those who haven't studied their logical sources. But yours are totally different from anything I've seen. At first, I thought you must be an advanced Dursite agent come to sabotage us. But you definitely aren't from Durs. Maybe a Prospicient double agent? I also consider the weird trolls who keep pestering me. Are we actually gonna have the trolls in this? Because we haven't seen, we haven't heard hide nor hair a damn day of trolls. Which is weird because they were, they, I was under the impression that they were bugging the kids before John's birthday. I would have expected some sort of reference to them by now. I don't know. But they've been really quiet lately, and you don't really give me that vibe. And obviously you are not a human. Well, hang on, you... You are a human, right? Dude, I don't... I don't fucking know. <laughs> I, <laughs> she tilts her head and gives you a little... Really? Kind of look, and your stomach twists into knots. The more I look at you, the more I start to think you're like... Mm, how do I explain this? Okay, do you know what a furry is? Please don't call me a furry. I mean, sure, whatever. Wow, okay, that question is more loaded than her gun. Yes? Alright, so a lot of artists I follow do... Yeah. YCH? Commissions. And you remind me of one of those. Does that make, does that make sense? You have no idea what a YCH is. You cautiously ask her. It stands for your character here. Oh. Okay, that makes sense. I have not once, in my many years of fandom, heard that. Basically, an artist will draw a pose or scenario, but instead of putting in an actual character, they'll leave a blank outline, like a mannequin. Okay, I know about mannequins, I know about templates and bases like that, but I always refer to them as bases. You pay them to put your own character there. And when I look at you, I feel like I'm looking at one of those blank spaces. My intuition doesn't tell me anything about you, and you've never showed up in my dreams. You're like my best friend Beck over here. A complete wild card. Wild card! It's something I can't figure out. Which brings me back to my point! At the point of your gun. <laughs> she had almost let her gun drop, and you had almost forgotten she was holding it, but she hefts it back up to point at you and steals her gaze. You're going to tell me why you came here and did what you did. And then you're going to help fix it. I'm afraid you're going to fall again. Please don't fall again. The rifle is really starting to bother you. Uh, 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 get that gun away from her. Get that gun away from her. That seems like the bad choice. Let's go with that. You can't let a good opportunity slip between your fingers again. These fingers. You need to disarm her before she accidentally blows you to smithereens. There must be something else that will get her guard down. You ask her about her... Fuck. Ugh. 
Shit, okay. I don't know how long that's gonna fucking last. There's a hole somewhere in it. I don't know where it is. You ask about her grandfather, the one who taught her about guns. He must surely be a reasonable and mature man. Perhaps it might be best to bring him into the discussion. You could sit down, have tea, drop the gun. I don't know. Grandpa doesn't love, uh, does love his tea time with guests, but usually conversations with him are really one-sided. Oh, is he that stubborn? Well, yes, he's a pretty obstinate man and a total blowhard. But as well, you may find him difficult to talk to on account of the fact that he is also a stuffed corpse. <laughs> Oh! Oh, cool! I <laughs> like that it's all caps! Oh! Oh, cool! Yeah, that's cool! That checks out! This is fine! Everything's fine! You love guests starring in a goddamn Hitchcock movie! This girl is clearly too unstable to be reasoned with. You need to disarm her, and pronto. You steer the topic away from the grandfather she surely murdered, and wait for another lull in the conversation! <laughs> when her eyes start to water and her grip slackens, you spring forward and reach for the rifle! She shrieks and goes for the trigger, but before uh, she can fire, an ear-splitting or before she can fire, an ear-splitting bark rings in your ears, and the world explodes into neon green. You feel weightless and empty, cocooned in bitter cold. For half a second, you think you just got Avada Kedavra, but then you glance around and see the stars. An iridescent light, sh uh, an iridescent light show, twinkling all around you, painting the vast expanse with beaded glimmers. It is transcendent. It is beautiful. You are at peace. Or maybe that's just the asphyxiation talking. <laughs> Yep, space junk. <laughs> well, cool. I got the bad one. All right, I got I got the quick bad one. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. All right. Awesome. Off to a good start this time. Man, there's a lot going on. All right, stay calm and explain yourself. All right. Pretty much everyone except John has called you on your bullshit thus far, so you may as well give her the full confession. You absolutely did change the course of reality, but if it, it but it was the result of a genuine fuck up, not ill intent. It's kind of a long story, but you relate it as best you can. Or as best you can. Your strange lack of memory, your encounter with a bizarre and magical artifact, the way you blundered into John's life and destroyed his mail as a result of your highly relatable social anxiety. <laughs> the girl listens intently as you explain what brought you here, and then you offer an apology. You think that you have irreversibly altered the very fabric that threads her cosmos together. There's probably no way of putting things back like they were and letting this lady go on her golden dream quest, or whatever she was blathering about, while you're distracted by her very deadly gun. Okay. You sound very sincere, and I'd like to believe you. So I'll take you at your word for now. Whatever shenanigans you involved yourself in, I trust that you did not intend to cause any problems. Let's all put this ugly business behind us. The girl... Oh, the art in this game is so cute. The girl holsters her rifle, and you breathe a long sigh of relief. Sorry about all that. I promise I only had the best intentions. It's cool, you tell her. You get the distinct feeling you've dealt with much worse. <laughs> you know, it's a fair point. I had a death cyborg try to come after me in one timeline. Yeah, I'd imagine a space hopper like you has been to all sorts of cool and dangerous places. I'm kind of jealous, really. Stop. No. Shit. You wouldn't believe the MacGyver bullshit I had to pull off to get this to work. The bed is gone. It's dead. I have to move on without him. I am so hot. <laughs> Try to work this bullshit out. Anyway, apologies. Let's move on with our lives. Oh, it's so warm. But anyway, we never probably introduced ourselves. Yeah, you're telling me. Uh. My name is Jade, and my dog's name is Beckerel. What's yours? <laughs> Beckerel. I, that's the closest I ever got to pronouncing it. <laughs> huh. You know? You think this is the first time you have ever been asked for your name? Ever? You almost forgot you had one. You tell Jade your name. Huh. That's a very unique sounding name. I like it. I am Brodimus. I'm saying it. It's Brodimus. I don't know. You tell Jade that you like her name too and she beams at you. Thank you. I'm so glad my grandpa gave me this name. It's so pretty and fairly unique and just very likable. <laughs> Anyway, why don't I show you around? I can give you a tour of the house and we can, uh, we can get to know each other a little better. Oh, that sounds great. You're an expert on taking tours of other people's houses, which makes sense that you don't exactly have your own house. Jade stares sadly at you. I'm very sorry to hear that. No, it's cool. You have magic now, so the trade-off is probably pretty fair. Right. Well, um, this is of course my room. As you can see, I have a ton of pretty posters. This is my favorite. It was a gift from Dave and I love it to pieces even though it's honestly pretty dumb looking, but that's the point. She gestures to a post of Dave's webcomic guys with animal attributes scribbled onto them. Most of the other posters also feature anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic fauna drawn with a significant more finesse. It all gives you a very furry vibe. But not in a bad way, you clarify. Her lips twitch in irritation and it occurs to you that people are probably constantly either clowning on 
clown her for liking furry stuff or reassuring her that they aren't uh, they aren't about to clown her, <laughs> clown on her for liking furry stuff. Wow, that was a fucking sentence to stumble my way through. Well, I don't actually dress up in suits or any of that nonsense, but I really love animals, and I think it is fun to imagine what it'd be like to be one. <laughs> Which is why I own so many animal toys. I like the Manthro chaps, who are very silly but dignified fellows who are part animal and part Victorian era gentle, sir. Okay. <laughs> Jade gestures to a pile in the corner, heaped high with plushies and dolls of all sorts. Many of them look like man-animal abominations with curly mustaches, and others feature bright and puffy squid-like creatures. Oh, oh, and these are my squiddles! They're based off a cartoon show. Rose says it's a bad show, but I don't believe her. Jade fishes through the toy pile and receives a dark bluish black toy. This one is Oh, that's a word. This one is Inkabel. She's my favorite. In one episode she gets in one episode she gets lost in the murky brine swallows and spends years completely alone, lost without any of her friends. Years? But in the end, her friend Podlight tracks her down and saves her. It seemed so bleak the first time I watched it that I literally cried, but I realized in the end that it was a very poignant tale. Jade smiles wistfully down at the plushie in her hand. That's okay. <laughs> She glances from it to another one of the Squiddle dolls, and her expression tightens. She squeezes the doll just a little too hard, causing a horrendous, pitchy squeak. I guess in retrospect that was pretty silly, though. <laughs> I mean, it was just a kid's show. Of course there was going to be a happy ending, that's how those always work, right? Jade's still smiling as she tosses the doll under her bed, but she puts so much force into the throat that it goes careening off the edge of the wheeze. You hear it plop onto the floor and magnetize itself to another Squiddle. Its voice buckles out as weak little... <laughs> Jade stands up and brushes off her skirt. Her eyes fall to her bedspread, which features a striking cloud design. She sighs slowly, and then assumes a bright smile once more. Anyway, let's go explore the rest of the house, shall we? I've got so much to show you. Okay. What did I do to my finger? Why does my finger hurt? Jade hikes up her skirt and skitters down the spiral staircase, two, spe two steps at a time. You're a little interested in the high-tech devices laying on a workbench near her bed, and a glowing green crystal that you think is literally uranium, but Jade's already gone, so you tear your eyes away and follow. <laughs> Oh, the window's over there, too! I forgot. The landing below her room is small and cylindrical, and features only a gray closet-looking device and a platform on the floor. My room is at the top of a tower, but this transportalizer will take us to the garden quick and easy. Transportalizer? <laughs> she hops on and disappears in a flash of green light. You're a little nonplussed, but you've seen weirder. <laughs> you step onto the platform, hear a light click beneath your feet, and in an instant, you're standing in a lush garden atrium. There are exotic plants as far as the eye can see, ranging from psychedelic flora arrangements to tropical fronds to fruits and vegetables. Tall windows blanket the walls and allow sunlight to stream in, and said windows are coated in a steamy mist. You feel like you just got clotheslined by a rainforest. That's an interesting phrase. It's beautiful, right? Jade opens her arms and spins around, gesturing to her various gardening uh, stations. You nod. It really is. Gardening is another one of my favorite hobbies. It's a great way to get your hands dirty and do some real work. And the end result is a really vi- uh, And the end result is really vibrant and beautiful. Jade waves her rough and calloused hands at you, and then strokes her fingers along the pinkish petal of an- of an anemone- Anemone, idiot. And hums a little tune toward it. One of its leaves seems to curl toward her touch. When Jade pulls away, she skips toward one of the windows and motions for you to follow her. It's a beautiful island vista- Oh, uh, wait, that's- she's not talking. It's a beautiful island vista that awaits your gaze. To your left is a towering mountain that might just be a volcano, and ahead of you is a small bay filled with giant lily pads and an old mossy temple. Beyond the island, the sea stretches out to a shimming her shimmering horizon. Past that boundary line, an entire world awaits, ever out of reach. This is my home! The entire island belongs to just me, Beck, and my grandpa. It's a very peaceful place. The greenery is so lovely, and the bay is very fun to take a dip in. There's some mysterious ruins down there, too. I've always been very curious about them, but Beck won't let me visit them. I guess he thinks they're too dangerous. Grandpa's been in there plenty of times before, though. Could her grandfather give her a supervised tour? Oh, Grandpa doesn't really move much anymore. He spends all of his time having tea parties in the foyer. <laughs> He's quite old, then? You could say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Jade wanders away from the, that, that window and toward another one, whose view is exclusively centered on the rolling blue. She presses a hand against the misty pane and sighs. You know, Dave talks a lot about coming to visit me here. I mean, all my friends do, but Dave especially. In his usual Davey way, of course, which means making lots of jokes and not sounding very serious about it. <clears throat> yeah, I'm itching to put on my safari hat and come tracing down to Doom Death Archipelago to get my ass murdered by Infinidob the Elder Retriever. Stuff like that. I know he really means it, though. He wants to see me, just like I want to see him. But it's just wistful thinking. He doesn't know where this island is. Even I don't know where it is. 
All deliveries here go through some company P.O. box my grandpa set up before we died, and it's not marked on any maps. Because this is a special eye with all kinds of important secrets on it, I guess? Or, it was special. I was special. But not anymore! Now I'm just a regular girl stuck alone on this dumb island for the rest of my stupid life! <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Hang on, time out! <laughs> Whoa, you asked Jade if she's feeling alright. Yes! I'm totally fine! Just peachy, thanks for asking! Come on, let's keep up with the tour! There's much no time for dilly-dallying! My grandpa's collection rooms are up next! The first one is full of his his big gum big game hunting trophies. I never shoot an innocent animal, and I think the trophies are pretty hideous. But I do have to admire his great work stuffing them, I guess. It is really hard to properly stuff and mount something, trust me. And he has some cooler stuff on the lower floors, like all these badass knight statues. Or these, um, faded blue portraits of pretty ladies? Okay, I'm gonna be honest, most of my grandpa's collection stinks. But I think what is important is that uh, is what it all represents to him. He's been on all sorts of incredible, amazing adventures, and he has this huge array of interesting things to show for it. You tell Jed that her grandfather sounds like a hell of a guy. Sure. He sure is. Back when I was little, he used to go on trips all over the world and come back with so many interesting stories and new souvenirs. I was so odd, and I guess a little jealous, too. Sometimes he'd be gone for days or even weeks at a time, and it would just be me and Beck holding down the fort. I was always so happy when he came back, and I listened to his tales without making a single peep. But, he never asked me if I wanted to come along for an adventure, no matter how obvious it was that I did. I guess it's just the way of life for, life for adventuring, folks. There's no time to be tied down, even by the people you love. They can stay at home and wait for you to come back. That's how it was for my grandpa, at least. What about you? You're an adventurer, too. You've visited all my friends, and you've surely been to other awesome spots around the globe. So, I bet you've left someone waiting for you, too, haven't you? Frost floods your veins and nestles into your heart with a burning chill for reasons that you don't quite understand understand. Jade tilts her head and bores <laughs> into you with wide, curious eyes. One of her hands is balled up into a fist, and both of them are trembling as she watches you. Jeez, you're gonna have to coach another kid through par uh, parental issues, aren't you? You swallow down your sudden anxiety, force a smile, and remind Jade that you're suffering amnesia. Oh, right. Well, it's just this feeling I get, you know? I have great intuition. When she smiles, the corner of her mouth twitches. It's now or never. Would you like to talk? I said I'm fine. There's nothing to talk about. Unless you want to talk about... Um, some of these flowers? Isn't this one such a lovely yellow? Surely there's nothing wrong with the good old feelings jam, right? Jay's an expressive, empathetic, uh, empathetic girl. Feelings jam should be her thing. You think that, but she's still steadfastly ignoring you. Hey, how about this orange with a uh, goofy face on it? Why don't we boggle at it for a while? Boggle at it for a while? Jade, something's wrong. You need to talk this out. That's what you do. You're a talker. So why don't you two... Oh my god, just shut up. Please shut your stupid fucking mouth. Shit. Of course something is wrong and that something is you! Me? There's a long pause. Jade stands there, her eyes wide, shocked at her own outburst. She wipes a tear from her cheek, takes a shaky gulp, and then sprints back up the stairs. Oof, that didn't work. You stand there for a while, feeling like a tender triple A grade jackass steak with a baked douchebag potatoes on the side. Hey, Beck. All right. Then you sigh and steal yourself and make the trek back up to her room. Jade is nowhere to be seen. Beck is pawing clumsily at a large, suspiciously jade-shaped lump beneath the covers of her bed. <laughs> you clear your throat and ask her softly if she wants to talk. It's cool, you say. You listen to teen drama all the time, and this is some particularly choice drama. Just real... Not that you like the drama, you clarify. You just kind of exist in the periphery of it constantly. You are a drama magnet. A dramagnet. There's a long pause, and you're about to turn and leave when she pulls the covers off and turns to you. Her eyes are all puffy and red. Hey. Hey. I'm, I'm sorry I yelled at you. It's not really your fault. I mean, it kind of is, but you didn't know you were mess uh, what you were messing. Uh, but you didn't know you were messing anything up. It's not fair for me to be pissed at you. It's just, none of this is fair at all. Yeah, that sounds like life, all right. You sit down on, yeah, that sounds like it. You sit down on the bed and tell her to vent about it. It's okay, you can take it. Okay. Have you ever spent your whole life waiting for something to happen and then it... it didn't? Well, your memory's pretty fuzzy right now, so you can't say you have, but you think you understand a similar sense of yearning. Good God, have you yearned! Yearning is a good word for it, yeah. Uh, let me try to explain. When I went to sleep, I would see this beautiful golden kingdom called Prospit and hang out with the people there. I'd wake up with these fuzzy, half-remembered feelings of happiness and visions of the future swirling around in my head. It was nice. It was a good life. There was this very lonely feeling that I couldn't make go away no matter what I did. I'd always tell myself, soon, Jade, soon it'll all change. 
You will get to travel to Prospect in your waking hours. You'll meet your friends in person. You'll finally begin to live, like, really live. I waited days, months, years for the day to finally arrive, and then it never came. I was so sure that it would come on John's birthday. All of my dreams told me so. All the signs were there, but it just didn't happen. And now I don't know what to do with myself. I was able to ignore the lonely feeling because I knew that it would disappear one day, but now that now that day has slipped me by and it's like it's like all those years are catching up and crashing down on me at once and I feel so so small and helpless and sad. The loneliest girl in the world. I don't wanna put this all on you. That wouldn't be very nice, but but it's just it's not it's not fair! Jade vaults from the bed and stamps her foot on the ground, hard. Her face is flushed and streaked with tears and snot. She looks awful, frankly, like someone who's been holding it uh, holding it all in for far too long. Beck gets up and starts licking at her cheeks, and she holds him off until she can wipe her face on her sleeve. <laughs> Thanks, Beck. At least I've got you for a best friend, right? Jade settles back onto the bed, stroking Beck's fur softly. I have a lot of complicated feelings about all this, I guess. I'm so complicated and painful that I'd rather just pretend everything is okay. But no. I can't pretend anymore, and these feelings are all that's left. And I hate feeling so glum, I hate sitting around being all sad and useless. And stupid and pointless, and a waste of my fucking energy is not who I am, and... And... I'm just... Dumping it all on you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I really am. Man, you just completely fucked up this girl's life! <laughs> Way to go, dipshit! And she's apologizing to you? Now you feel like the delicious three-layered shithead tiramisu served after that nice meal of steak and potatoes you had earlier. You really want to help, Jade. And while you still don't quite get all this magical moon stuff she's been talking about, you do get how it feels to be lonely. That's something you can help with. Or that's something you can't help with. You offer her your hand. Want to go see the world? She sniffles lightly and shakes her head. It's not going to work. Well, there's no way to know that unless you give it a try, right? She nods, stands up, and takes your hand. You focus on a familiar destination, John's house. But as you begin to dematerialize, Beck turns to stare at you and you hear that familiar barking sound in your ears. And when the flash of light subsides, you're standing here in Jade's room, only a few feet from where you started. What? See, I told you it wouldn't work. Come on, let me show you something. Jade hops up and shuffles down the staircase, and you follow. She takes you to the teleportation pad in the atrium. These transportalizers are all powered by thermal energy and use each other as beacons for the sake of easy short-range teleportation. But if you hook one of them up to a uranium converter and modify the coordinates spe specified on the logic board, you can theoretically go anywhere in the world. Which I tried. See? She twists up the top of the pad with her fingertips and pulls it off, and shows you the wiring underneath. It looks messy, like someone has made multiple attempts to rewire the circuits. But when I use it, it only led to the exact same thing that happened just now. Beck used his powers pre to prevent me from leaving the island. Maybe I got the coordinates wrong and I would have ended up stuck underground or something, but I checked and double-checked my measurements. I think Beck just doesn't want me to leave the island. He wants me to stay somewhere he can keep me safe and at all times. Mm hmm. I mean, yeah. Perhaps he heard his name from above, or perhaps he just has a sixth sense about it. Because Beck wanders down the staircase and over to Jade. She gives him a soft stroke behind the ear. I love him very much, but as long as he's around, I'm stuck here. And because of the changes you made, that is how, that is how it'll always be. I'm just... I'm going to have to get used to it, I guess. Jade deflates against one of the gardening tables and offers you a, a wan smile. Wayne smile. For, I don't know how to pronounce that word. I've only ever seen it in text. I've never heard it said. For a split second, you could swear you see droopy doggy ears and a tail tucked between her legs. <laughs> Depression to this degree simply is not conducive to friendship. <laughs> and even if it was, you would still feel pretty shitty about it. You should do something to cheer her up. Challenge Beck for superiority. That sounds like a bad idea. Let's do that! It seems to you that the cause of Jade's problems, even though he's probably not hurting her on purpose, is Becquerel. He's a good dog, and he wants to protect her, but the time for that has passed. Jade is a new uh, <laughs> omnipotent- uh, Omnipotent's a bit of a stretch here, buddy. Omnipotent friend in her life, and she's got places to be besides this island. There's only one thing for you to do. You need to establish yourself as the new alpha of the pack. This is such a bad idea. This has to be the bad ending, right? You must win the right to escort Jade to visit her friends. This is how dogs work, right? Yeah, it definitely is. You think? Only in captivity. Only in captivity. Wolves only show an alpha in a pack when they're in a captive setting, being observed in sort of like a zoo or like a, a special reserve type area. Out in the wild, wolves actually operate fairly democratically. I think. <laughs> anyway, you square up. Square up to a dog. Bend your knees and tense your palm palms. Okay. Um, what are you doing? 
Don't worry about it, Utila Jade. You're practically an expert in Lucis wrangling techniques by now. In what techniques? <laughs> in what techniques? She shouts behind you, but you're already charging. Beck doesn't see it coming at all, perhaps because he's such a spectacularly stupid thing to do. You go tumbling to the ground with him and manage to pin him. You know exactly what to do now. There is only one possible course of action and it has been inculcated with such mimetic gravity that you're entirely certain it will work as intended. Punch Beck in the stout to establish superiority. Great. You punch Beck in the snout to establish superiority, and immediately realize it's not working as intended. He snarls and flares up neon green, energy crackling around his body. You wince as he washes over you as, as if you just opened the, an oven door, an oven, an oven door, and your arm hairs stand stiff in electric terror. What were you thinking? This is a fight you can't win. Yeah! Beck lunges at you and sinks his fangs into you. You yelp, pain splitting your sight, radioactive fire roaring up your arm. You yank yourself away and instinctively try to teleport, but as you disappear, Beck's teeth catch your shoulder and hold on tight. <laughs> Let's get me out of here, not found. The two of you are hurtling through the nothingness, and you're pretty sure you've left blood splatters on some meta narrative construct, like a website scroll bar or the Ren Peep debug screen or some shit. Oh, I end up on Durs? Eventually, you come exploding back into cannon and bounce off a purple spiral with an ungainly smack, dislodging Beck in the process. You tumble onto a bridge and scatter some dudes in goofy jester outfits, and Beck lands in front of you. Good boy! <laughs> We got it even here! He snarls and green flames crack the stone beneath his feet. So much for that. You throw up your arms in front of your face and squeeze your eyes shut as Beck lunges again, but you don't feel the sting of his fangs against your flesh. Instead, you feel the singular, singularly odd sensation of your body passing through Beck's, as though you've just had a window thrown at you, like a reverse defenestration. Refenestration? Unfenestration. I don't know. The world beyond your eyelids strobes green, and when you open your eyes, you find yourself staring into a massive, verdant sun. You think that went... Uh, you think that when Beck, that when Beck went in for the kill, he must have phased through him as his powers surged? It was pure dumb luck. You can't imagine what kind of precise timing it would take to pull that off on purpose. The good news is that you're alive, but the blood loss is really doing a number on you and you can't focus your powers. Your vision flickers at the edges and there's a ringing in your ears louder than the flickering flames of the sun. You only just barely hear a voice from behind you as your eyes, as your eyes glaze over. Really? Who is this douchebag? A box. Oh, okay, so that's a radio. Solix, be nice. This douchebag looks very injured. Oh, wait, is this is this a live radio? Shit! Solix, be nice. This douchebag looks very injured. I think they're going to have to restart and try again. Better luck next time! Hey! Hey! Oh, hell yeah! Oh, that's awesome! <laughs> that's super fucking cool! That's the bad ending, but we did it! Oh, that's so cool! Oh, man, I'm giddy now. Oh, man. All right, sweet. Okay, so stay calm and explain yourself. We we go for a while. Goodness gracious. All right, now we explore. All right, let's do it. You present your most finely honed smile of confidence and urge Jade to stand. This is no time to mope around. There is plenty of fun to be found without leaving this island. You suggest that perhaps with your help, you can give her the opportunity to explore that temple she's always been curious about. Really? That'd be super fun! But what about Beck? Oh, there's nothing to worry about there. You have a genius plan, you tell her. You tell her to just head on over to the temple and you'll take care of the rest. Seems like a bad idea. Okay, if you say so. But please don't do anything to hurt Beck, okay? I love him to bits. You wouldn't dream of it! Not on this route, at least. <laughs> oh, I love it! Oh, we're doing good this time! Jade transportalizes downward, and you turn your attention to Beck, who is idly sniffing one of Jade's plants. <laughs> Read that his pants. I was like, okay, that's weird. You advance on him slowly and with intent. You know what must be done. Pet the dog! <laughs> yes! Pet the damn dog! You just get right in there. You pet the hell out of this dog. You employ all your strongest pamper techs, <laughs> like the quick scritch up, the main massage, and the rare Coddle Brand EX, Doge Smite. <laughs> Doggy smites. I think it's supposed to be doggy. I don't know. I'm not in for the memes. Somewhere in the distance, a bluebird observes your masterful display and chirps happily. But suddenly, Beck's head snaps up and he points his snout in the direction of the temple. Whoa, whoa, whoa there, buddy. Now is no time to be thinking about Jade. Now is belly scratches time. <laughs> you start rubbing Beck's stomach and he flops on his back with his tail wagging at his and his feet curled up. Who's a good boy? Oh, it reminds me of my dog. My dog, she always flops over and just wants the belly rubs, but she does this thing where she has one curled up and then she sticks one paw out and just welcomes the pets. <laughs> She's so cute. I love her so much. Beck looks up at you and you see the cosmos reflected in his deep, piercing eyes and you understand. He's a good boy and he knows it. 
After a while longer spent threading your fingers through his silky fur, Beck curls up beside you and yawns, starting to nod off. You kiss him on the forehead and then take the opportunity to slowly stand up and exit the room, letting the sleeping dog lie. You're a little worried about alerting Beck by using your powers. He seems to be pretty keyed into that kind of space-time manipulation, so you just take the long route to the temple. Jade's Island is a very beautiful place, with rolling hills and lush sun-bathed plains. It looks like an excellent vacation destination, but it is also so bare. There's nothing and nobody around except for the hollow whispers of the wind. You can see how this place would feel much less like paradise after years spent stranded here. When you reach the lake surrounding the temple, you see that the giant lily pads outside have arranged themselves into a walkway that you can use uh, use it reach use to reach it. How strange and convenient! Hey, look at that! Well, this isn't uh, suspicious at all! You channel your inner frog and hop across. Hey! Up here! Jade calls down to you. She's at the temple entrance far above your head, waving down at you. Grooves carved into the wall from a, form a ladder that, uh, that you can use to climb up, and soon you are standing beside her at the entrance to the temple. A huge, imposing archway marks the ingress between this sunny island and the dark interior of the ruin. From within, you can see a faint yellow-green glow that seems to come from ruins carved into the walls. Spooky! Hey, it's spooked over, everybody. Okay, all right, I can dig it. As you proceed through the entryway, Jade runs a hand along to the glowing walls, her face bathed in a sickly green. In the sickly green. At the end of the hallway is a large, round platform decorated with cloudy designs and a glowing orb at the center. It doesn't pique your inner interior decorator, but Jade seems quite awed by the sight. This is Skaya! I knew this temple had to be connected to that world in some way. Jade rushes onto the platform and begins to descend. You quickly follow her before you're left behind as the elevator takes you down to an expansive and dark room below. Much like the rest of the temple, the space seems very sparse and it is illuminated by the faint glow of the ruins on the walls. A large purple lotus flower rests atop a pedestal in front of the elevator, petals wilted. There is an electronic display built into the pedestal, with a timer that could feasibly count down for millions of years, but it seems to be glitched, stuck a few hours away from zero, with the second's digit constantly racketing, ba uh, ratcheting back and forth between two numbers. Jade places a hand on the pedestal in size. Hmm, the number is stuck. I think this is the, a time capsule, but it's malfunctioning for some reason. Was I supposed to open it when the time was right? Now I'll never know. What else could this place be hiding from me? As if on cue, the elevator platform shudders and begins to rise behind you. As the platform ascends, it becomes clear that there is a pit beneath it, which is basically Video Game Logic 101. <laughs> Fair. Jade looks down into it, and you follow suit and see. Transportalizers? There's two of them, one a deep purple and the other a brilliant gold. Jade leaps down into the pit, which is a pretty brave maneuver because it's deep as hell and real life still has fall damage. <laughs> she grunts and sinks, in, uh, sinks to her knees from the impact, but quickly recovers and rushes over to the golden transportalizer. She examines it for a moment and then clambers on. With a soft click, the pressure plate is depressed and the device surges to life. She disappears in a bright flash of light. Well, shit, you better follow her. <laughs> oh, fuck, okay. You hop down and step onto the transportalizer and the same flash of light consumes your body. You feel something like wind whipping around you as your molecules are dematerialized and then reassembled in a new locale, a glimmering golden palace. Wow, this place is too fucking bright. Someone needs to crank the saturation down pronto. I don't believe it. Jade is looking around with wide eyes that reflect your golden surroundings. This is it. This is Prospect, the planet life is in my dreams. I didn't think it was possible to get here like this. What does it mean? Why am I allowed to be here right now? I should go talk to the queen. And with that, she's off, sprinting down the halls with a renewed sense of vigor. You scramble to keep up with her, threading your way through crowds of confused white shield folks in fancy outfits. They kind of remind you of yourself, but with chitinous bodies. You sidestep a lady carrying a, a paint can and shuffle down a lengthy golden staircase adorned with regal golden spikes, and you can only barely keep your eyes on Jade's long black hair as it swishes behind her. When you finally catch up, she's in the middle of an argument with two burly fellows in white suits. She stamps her foot at them, but they're undeterred, blocking her passage further. Eventually, Jade wheels around to look at you. She tries to soften her expression for your sake, but her face is still sour. Ah! The guards won't let me see the queen! Apparently she's really busy with something. They told me I'm not supposed to be here and that I have to leave right away. This is total- this is totally bull! I'm a princess! I swear some of these idiots can't even recognize me without the pretty golden dress. Ugh. I guess I'm not getting any answers here either. Let's just get out of here. And she's off again! <laughs> Fucking get- stop, Jade! <laughs> This time, striding forward with her fist curled and her jaw set, you glance back at the guards, whose furrowed brows strike you as more worried than ire, and then follow Jade back. You're almost at the exit when you see it. A dark silhouette, uh, a dark figure silhouetted against Sky's brilliant blue. They're humanoid in shape, with two leathery wings outstretched and inky black tendrils trailing behind. Crimson force crackles in, the, in their wake, and they swoop over the city like a bird of prey. Something about them gives you a major case of the heebie-jeebies. You do a nervous little half-jog back to the transportalizer and get the hell out of Dodge. Wait. 
is Jack doing the gonna do the red miles here? The temple feels oppressively dark compared to the blinding bright of Prospect. You spend a while blinking as your eyes readjust. The transportalizer you use just flares up red and then cracks. That's probably not a good sign, is it? You do what you do best, ignore it, <laughs> and climb out of the pit. Great! Jade is standing beside the lotus contraption, running her hand along one of the pedals with her face set. What does all of it mean? Was this here all along? Has my grandpa been to the prospect before? If I can go there, then I must then it must still exist. The game must still exist, but how? None of it makes any sense. I need to think about this. You follow Jade slowly back to her house as she mumbles to herself, brows furrowed. You can barely catch what she's saying, but she's clearly thinking hard. The clouds have never been wrong before. Is it too early? Was this meant to happen? Once you reach the atrium, Jade lets out a sharp breath and nods her head. Resolute, she turns to you. Alright, I think I understand. I know what's going on now. Great! You offer her your most winning smile! What's the sitch? <laughs> Boy, it's not good. Well, the truth is I was, uh, I was always being very immature about the idea of being a hero and having a destiny. Life isn't like in kids' cartoons, after all. Hero isn't, isn't all rainbows and sunshine, and it's childish to think that everyone gets a happy ending. That kind of storybook stuff doesn't really exist. To be a real hero, you have to be prepared to suffer horribly. Uh, hmm? It makes sense when you think about it. If everything came easy, there wouldn't actually be anything heroic about it. Why else would my grandpa have put me on this island? Why else would Beck want to keep me safe here, even now I think that everything's changed? It's because it's my destiny. I have to prove that I'm willing to suffer and willing to sacrifice. That has to be it. This, okay. This can't all have been for nothing, right? That's not the way the world works. Everything has a purpose, even if it's not clear at first. Seeing Prospect in the flesh reminded me of that. My purpose is to do what I've always done, what my grandpa and Beck have helped me prepare for. I know I'll be really lonely, but in the end, it means that everything will continue to play out the way it's, it is meant to. It's a very noble job, and I've, I've got to be the one to do it. You're at a loss for words. This really doesn't feel like the right takeaway from all this, but you don't know jack about Spurb or Destiny or any of that nonsense, so who are you to say otherwise? So thank you for helping me visit Prospect. I wouldn't have figured this all out if not for you, and I'm sure that meeting me is one step along the way towards your mysterious fate as well. I'll be rooting for you. Jade erupts into a broad, beaming smile. It might be the first completely genuine smile you've seen from her this entire time, but that doesn't make you feel any better about it. In fact, it's more of a knife twisting in your gut, and when she throws her arms around you and hugs you tight, hugs you tight the knife pushes deeper into the boat. Well, you probably have more important stuff to do than keep hanging out with me. I'll let you get back to it. Something's weird. Something's off here. Jade turns around and heads for the staircase, leaving you to stare at her retreating form. Is this it? Will you accept the new destiny you've written for Jade and allow her to stay trapped here on this island? Oh. I get another choice. Uh. Boy, I guess we're gonna have, we're gonna have another part. Accept it? Sure, let's accept it. That seems like the wrong decision. Wow, huh. You're... Kind of a huge jerk, aren't you? Or maybe the narrative is a huge jerk? Is what you would say, but now you're practically in charge of the narrative, so yeah, it's basically just you. But Jade seems happy enough with her lot in life. Maybe she's better off this way, instead of whatever danger she would have gotten caught up in had she played Spurb? Yeah, you just keep telling yourself that. Bad end! Important heroic end! <laughs> okay. Okay. So now we got another one to do? Alright. Alright. Okay. All right, boy, howdy. This is really something, huh? All right, stay calm and explain yourself. All right, 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 all right. Okay, 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 okay. Explore. Zip through. Pet the damn dog. We zip on through all this. Do not accept. Some people might take this as a lesson in the responsible use of reality-altering powers. Some people might swear off manipulating canon entirely, but not you. What's the point of having sick-ass powers at all if you never use them? Maybe some god is going to punish you for the way you've been fucking with the universe, but right now you don't care. This girl will burn herself to ashes to keep her friends warm. Oh, that's a good phrase. That's a really good line. The least you can do is risk the flame for her sake. You can quickly sprint up the stairs. Oh! You're... not leaving. Don't you have places to be? I'll be fine here alone, I promise. It's my duty. I'll get used to it eventually. You can't imagine she's okay with that, no matter what she says. Does she really want to stay alone for the rest of her life? Well, of course not. What I want to do is explore the world and hang out with all my pals. But it's not about what I want. It's about doing what has to be done. That's what it has- uh, that's what it's always been about for me. Well, that's bullshit! Huh? Maybe Jade's fate dictates she never play the game she wanted to play. Maybe heroes don't get a happy ending, but that doesn't- but that doesn't mean heroes can't be happy. There comes a time in every young woman's life, you tell Jade, where she can't leave home because her pet is an overprotective god. 
Okay, that's obviously not true. <laughs> but there comes a time in many women's, young women's lives where circumstances beyond their control leave them without an escape. Perhaps it is easier to believe that the escape will never come, but you can't let Jade do that. When life has you stuck, at home, perhaps, hey, 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 you can still hold on to hope. You can fight. No matter how long you have to wait, you can keep looking for another chance to see the world. And if the universe tells you to sit, stay, and roll over, you look the universe dead in the eyes and ask, who do you think is the master around here? And then you tell it to motherfucking heal. Yeah. Yeah! You're right. Even now, I was still being childish. It was easier to tell myself to be miserable for a noble cause instead of holding on to hope and maybe getting hurt again. But I have to have hope. That's who I am. I'm a hoper, not a moper. <laughs> but I will... <laughs> I will keep trying to convince Beck that it, uh, it will be safe for me to leave the island. Things have changed. Maybe he doesn't realize it yet. He's kind of a silly dumb dog at times. But he loves me, and I love him, and we can work it out. Maybe it'll take a while, but it'll... I'll definitely figure things out. And while I wait, you'll come visit me sometimes, won't you? Of course you will. You're not in the habit of abandoning your friends. The idea is unthinkable. You promised Jay that you will come visit her. Come visit. Come visit! A light bulb goes off in your head. One of those cool LED bulbs, the kind that syncs up to your phone and changes colors. Smiles on you for the government! <laughs> oh, I love it. Party time! Party time? You ask Jade if she's ever had a slumber party. A slumber party? No, I've never had one. It sounds exciting, but, um, is it really a party if there's just two people and a dog? That sounds more like a bio slumber hangout. Don't worry about it, you tell her. Just start getting the place ready for a bash. Pull out the sleeping bags, conjure up some lightly irradiated snacks, pump up the fresh jams, etc, etc. I don't know if we even have sleeping bags, but okay. I'll see what I can do. Maybe there's something useful in my grandpa's old supplies. You shoot her a confidence salute, and then dissolve into the ether of cannon. <laughs> hey, John! All right, Egbert, up and at him, it's party time! <laughs> John yelps. I like to just pop in and scream at him. John yelps and tumbles out of his chair, crashing to the ground in an undignified heap. It looks like he was in the middle of debugging some code on his computer when you interrupted him. He disentangles his limbs and stands up with a groan. Uh, okay, Magic Mailman. We need to get some things straight. Your powers are extremely cool, but using them like this is kind of lame. Jump scares rank very low on the prank scale. <laughs> they don't take any effort. They're just sort of mean and annoying. You apologize for scaring John. Sorry, you're just in a very excited mood right now because it's time for a motherfucking slumber party! <laughs> oh cool, I've never been to a slumber party before. Who's it with? You grin. Don't you already know who with John? Mm, the American Association of Mailmen? Or the AM? You give him a blank stare. Oh right, probably with my other friends. That one should have been obvious. There you go, John! Good good on you, young lad! You tell him to pack up whatever supplies he thinks he should bring and then he get ready for another whirlwind ride through space time. I don't know, I should probably do the responsible thing and let my dad know I'm going on a trip, even though I will be back soon. Okay, that's fine, you tell him. You don't take too much time. Uh, but don't take too much time, this route's already getting pretty long. Cool, okay, what should I bring? Oh, I need to grab some movies, definitely. They will be there, right? I should bring some, uh, <laughs> McConaughey movies. Wow, I couldn't read that. McConaughey movies, so you realize I was right all along about Matthew's stellar acting. Oh, and of course, some snacks. It's a great time for me to unload all the excess birthday cakes my dad made me. Seriously, there are hundreds of them in the fridge. It is highly ridiculous. You, pa you wait patiently in John's room as he goes downstairs to fetch his bounty of cakes. Bountiful! <laughs> Talk to his dad and do all the other preparation. It takes forever. You're not really sure what he's doing down there. You think he might be walking around, examining all the objects in his home in great detail and solving a bunch of puzzles? <laughs> Come on, John, that's not the right genre of game. Get your shit together. Okay, ready. All right, step two is to go get Rose. You take John's hand and zap the two of you into Rose's mansion. John spends a while goggling at the giant statue of Zazapan, the learned. Then you ascend the staircase towards Rose's room and knock on the door. Her voice comes from within, slightly muffled. You're home early. I've been hearing strange noises from the neighboring loudly. Have you... Rose opens the door and freezes. John? Her eyes widen and she slowly steps backwards, which John takes as an invitation to stride into her room. Her cheeks darken as she scans the room, eyes flick <laughs> flicking from mess to mess. Surprise, Rose! We are here to steal you away, like the owl who kidnaps Harry Potter. That's not... She sighs and turns to you. Care to explain the sudden intrusion? It is normal, normally considered polite to call ahead, especially when one is possessed, uh, is possessed of reality-bending powers. Oh, don't be melodramatic. There's probably nothing too embarrassing in this room. John furrows his brow as he glances around the room, eyes sweeping over the walls. He eventually settles on some pictures that have, that have been hung up. I mean, uh, look at these great drawings. Did you do those? That is so cool. I didn't know you drew stuff. Rose gives him the smile of a girl whose soul has just shriveled into a blackened husk. Again, an explanation would be nice. You explain that you've come to collect Jade's friends for a slumber party. I see. The commercial and critical failure of Suburb must have impacted her more strongly than I anticipated. She was really looking forward to playing the game with us. Yeah, that's... putting it lightly, probably. I would hate to, to disappoint her further. Consider this my RSVP. 
Rose gives you a curt nod and then turns to frown at John, who's poking around under her bed. Something tugs at the corner of her mouth. John, my mother is busy and will not be expected to return for a while. Why don't you and our strange friend go analyze her room instead? I need time to pack. Oh, okay, Rose, whatever you say. <laughs> Rose shoves you out of the room with more strength than you expected from a 13-year-old girl and shuts the door hard. Man, I hope realizes I hope Rose realizes that I was being serious when I said her drawings were good. We tease each other a lot, but she's really cool. John's speaking loudly enough that Rose can almost certainly hear him from the other side of the door. You think he knows that, but you don't say anything, except casually suggest that you and John go wait downstairs and admire all the ridiculous wizard art. He agrees. God, this house is so weird. Who needs a giant statue of a wizard? Where did they even get this? Oh, and speaking of weird, I didn't want to bring this up with Rose in case it's just some funny story I'm not on, in on, but what's with all the writing on her? But John trails off as Rose descends the stairs with a neatly packed bag. That's right, the kids, or John and Rose at least have like writing on their walls, but they don't see it, like they, they've blocked it out of their, their perception. Right? I don't remember. Shall we? We shall, you say. With a hand on each of their shoulders, you close your eyes and concentrate on the Strider apartment. You're aiming for the hallway outside the front door, but this power is still taking some getting used to, so you instead pop into existence right on top of Dave's bed. He's tapping away at something on his computer, and as, you so as soon as you appear, his entire body tenses up. You've barely had a moment to react before Dave wheels around in his chair and flings a handful of shurikens at you. One of them grazes Rose's cheek so closely, a strand of hair, a pale hair, flutters to the ground. She turns to look at the weapon, now embedded in the wall, and runs a finger along the edge of the blade, squinting. Oh, Jesus, shit. What the fuck, man? Uh, surprise! <laughs> okay, rule one of time travel or dimension hopping. Don't fucking pull this kind of shit. I mean, seriously. Under any, under, under any other circumstances, I'd be shitting my fucking nuts off the, about the opportunity to chill with my best bro. But dude, you can't just drop a guy's bestie, a guy's besties in the middle of his room out of nowhere like this. There's an extreme social faux pas. You gotta give a guy some time to. Oh, you gotta give some guy. Ah, fucking hell, Dave. You gotta give a guy some time to, to prepare. Don't be melodramatic, Dave. I assure you, there's nothing present in this room that could make us think lesser of you. If Rose was scarred by that near-death experience just now, she doesn't show it. She hops off the bed and glances around. If you left any pornography out, it will only serve to confirm the hypotheses I have already made. <laughs> Dude, are these selfies? Are you doing the duck face in this one? <laughs> oh, man! Oh, for fuck's sake, John. You get a VIP all access backstage pass, and the first thing you do is insult my stuff? Like some rowdy tool at the Nickelback cons are rummaging through their closets instead of doing the musical world a favor and assassinating them. Oh, yeah. You do the same, dude. Touche. But anyway, aside from getting this, your grubby hands all over my pristine collection of cool swords, what the hell are you all doing here? We have a slumber party! Are you in? Oh. I don't know. Bro is basically always keeping tabs on me. Guy wants me to be safe, you know? Wants me to be safe, you know? Or rather wants me to be the only to uh, only be in the right kind of danger to teach me lessons about irony and being a dope ass fucking ninja master. It's all some pretty intense supervision is the point I'm being made here. I was already getting some rank vibes from him after that little jaunt over to Olive Garden. Actually the vibes I have been uh, actually the vibes been off, off ever since John's B day if I'm B day if I'm being honest. So I don't know how he'd feel about me gallivanting off some, on some magic snooze adventure with Slappy the time traveling mailman. Seems like the kind of thing he'd take issue with. Oh, come on, he can't be that bad. What kind of guy wouldn't let his brother go hang out with his friends? I... Yeah, I guess. Be a pretty shitty uh, kind of guy if he did that, wouldn't he? Dave stares off in the middle distance for a while. Rose observes him intently. Look, Dave, I don't think it would feel right if we all had a big party and you weren't there. And Jade would really miss you. As would we. Yeah! Dave glances furtively around his room, around the room as if he's expecting a camera to blink at him from, uh, uh, from up in one of the corners. All right, I'm in. Let me, let me just, let me grab some some subs. That's supplies for short. Hey, mailman, what's Jade's hell dog look like? Or like, do I need to bring one of these cool ass swords? Cool. These swords are like five buck Chinatown swords, aren't they? What? No. Okay, listen. <laughs> While Dave grabs the stuff and John heckles him affectionately, Rose's attention has been drawn back to the shuriken Dave threw at her. You stroll over and ask her what's up. She responds with her own question. Have you been introduced? Have you been introduced to Dave's brother? Not yet. You've heard a lot about him, though. For the sake of diplomacy, you only briefly touch on touch on the opinion you formed. He certainly seems like a fascinating man, the kind of individual whose brain I would love to pick apart to find out just what twisted mechanisms fire off within its chambers. So what's uh, so that's what she's thinking about, Dave's bro? Rose shoes on her bottom lip. Not exactly, but an adjacent topic. I'm mulling over the ethical quandaries presented by the existence of powers esoteric. What? It's nothing to concern yourself with yet. We have a party to attend, apparently. Right! Party! <laughs> well, that's really slowed down, didn't it? Dave is done packing up. You open both palms to suggest that everyone hold hands so you can best channel your powers. Really? We're holding hands? God, this is so lame. But he does it. <laughs> he still does it. Point of fact. 
And when he clasps John and Rose's hands, he shifts around and blushes faintly in a manner that suggests he doesn't really think it's so lame. In fact, he may think it's the opposite of lame. He may think it's rad. And he'd be right. Friendship is the raddest thing of them all. Hell yeah. You're full of, a, of warm and fuzzy friend feelings as you teleport back to Jade's atrium. Wait, no, that's just the feeling of your body dissolving and recon reconstituting itself halfway across canon. They're very similar feelings. Very closely related, actually. You head to the- this is fucking long. You head to the base, uh, of the staircase, where you call out to Jade. Her guests have arrived, you tell her. Jade rushes down the staircase and nearly trips over her skirt. Her expression is tight and anxious, and when she sees her- your motley clue standing there, she freezes up. Her breath hitches in a half sob. They are all slightly off-white, I just realized. John's a little bit more blue, Rose's a little bit more purple, Dave's a little bit red, Jade's a little bit green. Seeing them all next to each other now, it's interesting to see that they are all just all slightly off-base white. That's really cool, actually. I really like that. You really did bring them. They're here! You're all here! Jade breaks into a wide grin and sprints forward, launching herself like a missile at her friends. Dave throws himself bodily out of the way, and Rose takes an alarmed step back, leaving John to bear the full brunt of her affections. She crashes into him, and the two of them go spinning around and around as Jade laughs breathily. Whoa, whoa, calm down there, Jade. It's nice to see you, too. <laughs> Tears are beating in her eyes as she squeezes him tight and then pecks his cheek with a soft kiss. Oh, John, I'm so happy to see you in person. I'm... They sound very similar. I warned you. I wasn't anticipating to have them all here together, though. But you can see it side to side. In waking person and everything. I spent so much time watching you sleep. Ah. Uh, what? <laughs> yeah, Jade. Reel it back a bit here. Jade swings around to look at her other two pals. Come on, you two. Get over here. We're having a four times hug combo right now. <laughs> Rose and Dave cautiously step forward, and Jade, with John's help, yanks them both into a tight embrace. She smooches them on the cheeks, too. Rose's face lights up with a blush, and Dave nearly goes catatonic. <laughs> when Jade pulls back, she's clutching John's hand and tugging so hard she might pull the damn thing off. Come on, come on, everyone, let's go upstairs! I found a bunch of military-grade sleeping bags in Grandpa's old inventory gear and set them up in my room! We can all play with my toys and jam out to some music and stay up all night chatting with each other and oh my god, oh my god, okay, you're here, you're here, all here! This is all really happening! Jay's next next lab version hysterical and she's got tears streaking down a streak down her cheeks. Dave looks a little perturbed. Wow, holy shit, uh It's cool, Jade, no need to get so like this. It kinda fucks me up seeing you cry. Not that I'm <clears throat> trying to make this all about me. I mean, uh Dave, you're doing a horrible job of comforting her. Jade, come here. I shall hold you in my arms. <laughs> I shall hold you in my arms. This is how we humans embrace. <laughs> Rose walks over to Jade, extends her thumbs, and swipes them down. Okay, <laughs> I was like... <laughs> and swipes them down Jade's teary cheeks with a stiff mechanical motion. Then she wraps her arms around Jade in an embrace that could generously be called a hug, but looks more like the precursor to an alien <laughs> medical examination. John boggles at the display. None of you whack jobs know how to do this. Oh my god. Come here, Jade. <laughs> Aw, oh, thank you, John. Now come on, everyone, let's go! And so the party begins. Tales told, movies watched, and fun had a plenty. So many shenanigans happened. So many. Just, you gotta believe me. You had to be there. Perhaps someday you will recount them all in, de in detail. But before you know it, the energy in the room has fled alongside the sunlight. The moon and stars cast their pale gaze upon four supine friends, bundled up in sleeping bags and caught midway between slumber and wakefulness. Dave is rambling about some inane bullshit that nobody's paying attention to, and Rose is attempting, quite terribly, to lecture John and Jade on the modern reinterpretation of Lovecraft's work. Works. You think it's about time you bowed out. It's not that you haven't enjoyed chumming it up with these kids, but you feel kind of weird sticking around overnight. You can come back later. Besides, you've got places to go and sights to see. There's an entire golden moon out there full of potential friends that you know nothing about before. Uh, before today. The universe beckons and you are powerless to refuse. You give Beck a little nod like, hey, take care of these kids. Beck doesn't nod back because he's a dog, but you like to think he understands. <laughs> As you quietly slip down the staircase and out of sight, you spare one last glance at the group, group and find a sigh escaping your lips. Everything that's happened here feels almost too good to be true. Can it last? Can this brazen wish fulfillment go unpunished? You find that hard to imagine. There's something fate touched about these kids. You can feel it in your bones. As surely as the wind whispers through the trees or the, the stars dance through space, as surely as the turning clocks will call the sunlight back again, these kids will never be free of the bullshit that hounds them. But right here, right now, they're at peace. They have shared uh, they have shared this one perfect moment together, and perhaps in the future there will come more betwixt the chi be uh, more will come more betwixt the chaos. And maybe that's enough. Hey! <laughs> oh, we did it! <laughs> Aww. Oh, okay! There really wasn't much of a transition into the trolls, but anyway! 
that's the video, everybody. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you click the like button down below. Subscribe so you can keep with my stuff. New video every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Next week, it's going to be more Colonel Sanders. <laughs> Get ready for that bullshit. Uh, comment. Let me know what you guys think about this. It's kind of interesting that this weirdly, only the bad ending led into the trolls. I imagine we're going to prospect next. I don't know what that means necessarily because... I don't know if we're going to meet the trolls there, but that doesn't make any sense, because we're at the point where, like, Aradia and Solux are waiting at the green sun. Boy, I don't know what any of that means. <laughs> I don't know what that means for the narrative. But anyway, I guess we'll see. Let me know what you guys think about this, because it's really cute, really fun. Uh, and share it. Share it with your friends. If they're homestuck, show them. Just these kids get a just a good time, because the bullshit they are subjected to, and the, uh, the main, the canonical story, wow. <laughs> but anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Later, everybody.